This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the £4 pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit begambleaware.org. Uh, be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk. It's the True Faith Newcastle United podcast. Newcastle have gone to the city ground and beaten Nottingham Forest by three goals to two to make it four away wins in a row in 2024 and continue Newcastle United's decent form this calendar year. I'm Alex, I have Sai, Charlotte and John Lane to talk to you about what happened and why in this one. Sai, I'm going to start with you, mate. How good was that feeling to go away from home once again in the Premier League and pick up all three points? I'm glad you said how good was that feeling and not just how good was that game because the game itself was um, interesting. But winning another away <laughs> game is uh, is class. It's 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 a good feeling. It's a uh, it's massive for, for where we are and where we're going to try and get to this season. Back in seventh, still in the FA Cup. We've just won three. No, four, well, you, you said it's four away games. Two yeah. of the, two of them are cup, but you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, all, it's all it's all it's all stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's away. all steps in the right direction. You know, the, the stuff to get into about the performance and about the way we got to that victory. But we are we are learning to win games again, and that's really really good. And I'm getting more and more confident each week, as clearly some of the players are that will c- continue this form. And you know, Bournemouth next week looks like a really easy win, as far as I'm concerned, based on the fact that we're scoring goals. Fun, yes, we're conceding a bit, but honestly, yeah, I, I was really pleased. And um, I suppose. In terms of learning week on week, we conceded the lead twice against Luton and then failed to win the game. We didn't do that here. We conceded the lead twice, but had the character and the conviction to go away and get a third and, and win the game. And yes, it took some brilliance from Bruno Gomez. In fact, all three of our goals are unreal. But Bruno, sometimes you just need your world-class players to come and, and grab the game by the scruff of the neck. He's done that. We've won the game. We move on. Class. That's it, isn't it? It's, it, it you know, it was just it's just so encouraging to me to have have picked up three points away from home when all of the conversation to, for the first half of the season was what the hell has happened to our away form yeah. what on earth is going on um to, to 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 even just build on the performance from last week obviously that was a home game against Luton and there was a lot to say about that and that was a it was a difficult game and and we went we took the lead and then we lost the lead and we ended up with a point well it's, it's, same thing happened here we took the lead twice in this game and lost it twice and then still managed to these are incremental sort of improvements that you know we're going to keep making uh, week on week you'd hope I, I see no reason why not and players are going to come back we are back in training we are back to once a ga- game once a week um and so I'm just I'm so encouraged by it I'm so buzzing that we got the three points we're a real sort of momentum team and coming out of you know half past seven last night I was just like thank fuck for that <laughs> yeah I mean the result's the most important thing isn't it here um but I think for the first 10 minutes, we really tried to play um, and we, we looked in control. Um, now, funnily enough, if you watch um, some highlight packages that are going around, the first chance you see is Forrest's chance on the break um, after we've had 83% possession or something ridiculous in that first 10 minutes. Um, so I think we tried to approach the game the right way uh, um, for me, um, but the result's huge. Um, I can't remember the last time we won four games in a row. And it was a very un Eddie Howe Newcastle win, I think, in the fact that um, normally when we win, um, you know, we're a few goals ahead. We manage the game that way. Um, this is the first time this season I can recall anyway where we've had to manage that game like one goal up and we've managed to actually get to 90 minutes and, and do it. So that for me, I think the squad probably needed that to show that they could do that and have that character of even when things aren't perfect, that they're going to get that result. And look, we've said it before, good teams win badly. Um, and, and maybe we did a little bit of that yesterday. Yeah, I think the talking about the end of the game is is relevant because I was actually most impressed by Newcastle at nil nil and at three two up because at nil nil, uh, how tries out this new formation in possession, um, which we'll come on to a little bit later in the show. And Newcastle, like you say, dominate a game away from home that we haven't really seen them do in terms of uh, volume of possession, and they really asked a lot of questions of Forrest before before getting the first goal what happens between one nil and three two up is is probably <laughs> worth debating i think we will talk about it because it wasn't straightforward but managing the game like they did three two up 
Dubravka's not had to make a save. There's no close calls. It feels like in previous situations where we've been trying to cling on, there's been kind of some mitigation that Howe has been able, unable to make subs where he could yesterday. But even though we conceded last minute against PSG and last minute against Chelsea, neither of those sides, um, I think it, it could be argued, didn't deserve the equaliser. Forrest didn't mm. deserve anything at 3-2 mm. yesterday. That was probably their worst period of the game. You know, Newcastle's best periods obviously were Forrest's worst periods, but just so impressed with Howe's tactics, the defensive substitutions. These are all things some fans have questioned recently. Can he do this? Can he manage these games? And I think that Newcastle at 3-2 yesterday were just in control of that game. There was no last-ditch stuff. There was no panic. There was no reliance on the opposition failure. Um, uh, you know, just, just generally impressed by their ability to win a game. And, and this is the key thing that I took away from this yesterday. And I suppose from this little run we've been on, yes, Sunderland are a lower league side, so they don't count as, as much into, in this conversation. Training. But if you keep yourself in games in the Premier League away from home in particular, you will pick up wins and points because a lot of these teams are bad. A lot of these teams are just bad. And Forest in 16th place are, by the league standards, not a good side. Mm. Um, there have been too many away games this season where the game's been gone on 80 minutes or the game's been gone on 85. If you can keep yourself in that position in these games against these sides, you will you will have a lot of joy. And I just felt that performance at 3-2 yesterday was so mature and so much better. Yes, there are still glaring deficiencies to Newcastle's play or defensive structure or midfield structure but, and we'll talk about those but I just think when you when you're away games in the Premier League and you're going to be all right and we did that yesterday I think Forrest kind of fell apart in that last 15 as well including injury time but that like they just they just weren't creating anything they couldn't keep a hold of the ball and it, it, they just didn't look like any kind of threat but I also think that speaks to us and and the control we were we were exerting over the game and the the, the comfort like we've seen this team kind of panic a little bit towards the end of games, get tired, more tired. Obviously, fixture, you know, congestion has has led to that. But we, even against Luton, they had a they had a chance at ninety seven minutes, and you're sort of sitting on the edge of your seat, thinking, "Please God, like let just get us for this point." Didn't feel like that yesterday, and that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these incremental improvements. These will sort of snowball into hopefully a really great run of form because they're all the little improvements that we need to be seeing: the the, the calmness, the maturity, the control of the game, right through to the end. We looked confident, didn't we? Like at three three two up, we when we had the ball, we just looked more confident, and it's almost. I think that's probably. I know this is the positive part, so I'm going to try and stay positive. But I suppose my question is, is we need to look like that more when we're, we're behind or when we're trying to chase the game, just look more confident and assured in what we're doing. Um, it's almost like we've got the lead and we're like, oh, yeah, we know what we're doing and we can we can play it around and we can manage the game from here. So um, I hope that, that can, they can kind of learn from that and almost say, actually, this is a way that we can play when things aren't going great as well. I, I don't feel like I saw the second half. The same way. I thought we were pretty poor until, I suppose, uh, to make this positive, it was until mm -hmm. we made the subs because I thought before the 80th minute when Livermento came on and Kraft came on around the same time, or maybe a little bit later, um, I thought they looked like scoring every time they came forward. Forest were quite explosive and they just had us done for pace and in those channels and uh, they, they were causing problems every time they had the ball. Now, we had a lot of the ball and we were quite dominant overall, but I thought we looked shaky and, and vulnerable at the back every time they got the ball until about the 80th minute and maybe they'd overexert themselves you know they, they play quite explosive football um they've got some quick players who just run out of steam i guess but we did manage the game better towards the end of it like you say we got three two up and, and by the 80th minute we were, we were like right there's only 10 well should have been 50 minutes ago they got an extra two bonus minutes from uh, from taylor didn't they at the end inexplicably but yeah i thought the the changes to, to end the game with three right backs and three center halves on the pitch was it was a needs must situation it's like right just get the lads on just see the game out let's not take any more risks let's not just leave the lads at the back and let the same thing happen again so addressing it and doing something about it is probably the biggest positive because i thought second half the first 20 minutes we were awful uh, we, we offered nothing then then a moment of bruno brilliance got us back in the lead and then we dealt with that situation so i think learning as we go like I say Charlotte, incrementally mm -hmm. there are improvements but I, I thought the second half was probably worse than the first half. <laughs> I'm definitely talking about that last like 15, yeah. 20 yeah, minutes, yeah. like it, and and just the kind of settling into it. That that yeah, Forest are a game or a, or a team that, that look for the break and then just run. But I, we, we we did deal with it. Like th they were shaky moments, but we dealt with it. And then we just were like, actually, this is fine. And mm. then they started to fall apart a little bit. 
Yeah, let's talk about the the, the middle bit of the game then, because th- there is definitely a feeling out there that you know all is not well, all is not fixed, and the you know let's talk about some of the things that went wrong. Uh, I mean, I've got by the way my notes for this game just Matt Sells just that's all it says <laughs> what the fuck is he there doing? a big question mark T- turning, turning up in a game against Newcastle United eight years after we signed him and then <laughs> realised he couldn't make any saves um, I don't think he makes he makes one save does he actually have hands in those gloves <laughs> he, makes, like, he, just make, he makes a save against Sean Nonstack yesterday which is a decent save but he should probably save Bruno's winner yeah. as good a as good a shot as it was but you know we're, we're still very vulnerable in behind Forest on another day <laughs> I don't want to say probably should have a pen, but if the referee gives that penalty um, at 2-2, then they go 3-2 up in the game most likely. Um, you know, so it was a game of fine margins up until kind of that last 20 minutes when Newcastle managed it well. Newcastle once again take the lead twice against a poor side and then relatively quickly let the, the opposition back into the game. I mean, the, the big thing that I kind of noticed watching the game in in Aspers last night um, was that people watching the game are very quick to get angry about Dan Byrne. Um, so I, Dan Byrne kind of dominated the debate uh, in the build-up to this fixture this week after the kind of disaster class against Luton last week for him and Eddie Howe a little bit in that, from that perspective. This week, Eddie Howe tries a new formation when in possession, particularly in the opening stage of the game, kind of three at the back, including Dan Byrne, double pivot of... Miley and Trippier, then all of the rest of the lads ahead of them. Um, do you think that justified Burns' in- inclusion? Where, where do you stand on the debate after yesterday's game? It's a really good question because, yeah, had had he just played Burn at left back and played the same formation, it could have been a disaster and it could have been the sort of situation that had people asking questions of him and Dan Burn forevermore. And when they scored, that was at their first goal where the, the, yeah. the ball yeah, goes through and he just gets done for pace. And he'd already been done once for pace. And Dubravka actually makes a really good save. So it happened twice by that point. And you're right, the people around us watching this game are going mental and saying, get him off. <laughs> and like, it, it's not as simple as that. It isn't as simple as that. We, we, we've, we've talked about the last few weeks. There's a, there's a bigger problem on our left-hand side of, of there just not being any other cover there. So you're right, you try to change this formation. And Dan Byrne definitely suits being the left of a three, which it seemed like he was for most of the game. I still don't really understand where Trippi was playing. Sort of right wing back, but then he was tucking inside a lot. Yeah. So was he alongside Miley? Is that what we think was the, so like a three, two? Um, so uh, in theory, I suppose Miley's then supposed to be in that gap between Botman, Byrne, and where Elanga had so much joy. And I don't remember seeing Miley really get stuck in there because the, 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 he's 70 and he didn't really against massive Premier League footballers, he hasn't got much chance of having a physical impact. So the same problems were still exposed. And I thought for the first goal in particular, Botman and um, Byrne are inexplicably about 20 yards apart. Like they're so far apart. If you're a back three, you've got to be tight. You've got to be close. You leave the gaps out wide and force them wide if you have to, um, you know, but you just run straight through the middle and scored. And it's really frustrating to watch that. So does that justify what happened the other way around in terms of on the ball? I thought we were very good. And I thought, you know, our problem away from home has been very predictable. Mm. We've been very easy to defend against and we've offered nothing and we've scored three goals here by playing slightly different. I don't think Nottingham Frost knew what to do about it. So there is an argument that by mixing it up and yes, it meant Dan Byrne had to stay in defence. It, it's kind of worked. We've won the game, albeit they could have <laughs> they did score and could have scored more through the exact same faults that we have. So it's a really hard question to answer. But I do think because we won the game, the ends have justified it there. I think... Um Looking at the whole situation, uh, there's only one other player in our squad that could play that position that Dan Byrne played. Um, but that's Paul Dummett, and I don't think he's got the pace or the quality um, to, to usurp him. Um, I really like Tino, but Tino's not going to play um, left of a three and then as a as a left back uh, in that way. So if that's the way that we're wanting to utilise that defence, um, then that's the reason why Byrne gets in. Um I totally agree that he hasn't got the pace to deal with Alanga and we'd learned that on Boxing Day. Um, and actually for the first goal, Byrne anticipates that ball's going to play and he starts running before the ball's played and still behind him. So, mm. you know, runs that... Runs the wrong way though. He thinks, yeah. the, he thinks the run's going to come on the outside. Yeah. He's wrong. And, you know, so, you know, there's there's definitely work and hopefully that's something you can learn from. Um, but I don't see Dan Byrne disappearing from the starting lineup anytime soon. Um, and if I'm Tino Livramento, I am still sitting on the bench going... Well, why aren't I starting? What have I done wrong? But it, again, he can't play that system if that's what Eddie wants to do. I think there were still other problems which highlighted Dan Byrne's pace deficiency again in that we know that that's going to happen and yet the rest of the team didn't shape up on a couple of occasions. So 
there was one ball through to Gibbs White again, cuts out the midfield, and then he plays one ball through to Ilanga. Uh, and Debravka is so far back behind the defence. I think we, again, in game management, we 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 started to play deeper, and we had to play deeper because Debravka stays so deep that that gap between him and defence isn't sustainable. So the defence had to get closer to Debravka and bring the midfield further back and just close those gaps. And I think that's why towards the end of the game they didn't have as much joy. We were a bit deeper, and we don't like to end up deeper as the game goes on. But it was actually was the right thing to do in this situation because I thought, once again, again, I'm not digging out Miley, but Byrne was just left one-on-one with this guy who was obviously going to have his pants down. Is that that clearly wasn't the plan just to leave Byrne one-on-one when we've changed formation and, and tried to come up with a new plan. There must have been a plan for someone to be that close and for Botman to be closer and, and we still did sort of leave him out to dry almost. It's almost like the lads don't like Dan Byrne and they <laughs> want to see him have a mare. I don't know. No, nah, I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think it's that. It's no. not that. You know, like you say, Sai, well, well, midfield issues are still there. Bruno still can't make a tackle. He is playing with fire when he stands on the advertising hoarding for his winner because if he falls <laughs> oh forward, if he falls forward into that crowd, Andy yeah. Taylor is putting up that yellow card. Uh, Shout out Sean Longstaff holding yeah. him back. And if we think we look weak in midfield with him, I uh, dread to think what we'd look like without him. Um, but ultimately, that pass, like you say, Miley is too square. Is too square. He's kind of just ball watching. Gibbs White's in, and until Willock or Anderson comes back, I think Miley, at the stage of his career that he is, I just don't think there are any solutions to that. Mm. Anderson has been spotted carrying goals across the yeah, training pitch. So <laughs> weird, the man broke his back. Don't yeah. make him do that. <laughs> do we not have someone to do that for the lads? <laughs> but, um, until that happens, I think I think I think the most promising thing for me is they'd identified a weakness against Luton and before and they'd worked on it through the week. And that's really positive. And how um, has been accused lots of times throughout his career, and also at Newcastle, and also on this podcast, of only being able to play one formation in one way. And I think yesterday proved that it wasn't true. That's not true. Doesn't mean everything's fixed. Doesn't mean everything's perfect. Newcastle still have a lot of flaws. They don't actually create that much yesterday. Like I said, I think they have like four shots. Mm-hmm. Um, three of them go in. You know, that's good. Good finishing for you and good football. But I f- kind of feel like. If this is us at our worst, injury prone teenagers in midfield having to kind of create new formations just to try and project, uh, protect the left back a little bit more, it could be a lot worse. And if you think about Nick Pope in particular coming back, March is not a million miles away. Um, Nick Pope coming back, Joe Willock coming back, Elliot Anderson, Alexander Reesak coming back, Harvey Barnes getting more fitness. This team is on a positive trajectory at the minute. It's uh, just kind of two defeats in 2024, and we're halfway through February. It's four away wins. Uh, it's seventh in the league and a, a great chance of going through to an FA Cup quarter final. So the picture has evolved somewhat since since the, since that horrible December that we had. The picture is nowhere near as bad, and I think yesterday was a crucial win to help this team in its development. Well, that's exactly it. We've still won the game, and we've still got that midfield that we can't change. We've still got what looked like a totally unfit Callum Wilson up front. We've got Gordon who's just come back from injury again. You know, we're still plugging holes with 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 half fit players and, and yeah, Barnes has come off the bench and done a good job, but he's not fit yet, clearly, because uh, you you think he would have started the game over Gordon if he was in any position to. Um so yeah, we're still kind of cobbling together eleven players, and I suppose that's it's it's, it's a positive that we can win football matches when we're still like weakened significantly, like mm. you say. So it's a massive positive and we probably need to appreciate that that's they've worked really hard to get that result with a with a makeshift team again. We're going to leave it there for part one of the show. Part two is coming up after a couple of adverts. If you don't want to listen to the adverts, you get these podcasts advertisement-free on our Patreon platform. Our Patreon platform keeps this whole entity going and uh, you get daily Newcastle United podcasts pretty much from Charlotte, me, Sai and John and our colleagues. So link in the description to this podcast. Please consider joining up if you like what we do. Speak to you after these. I'll say it again because I like saying it. It is four straight away wins for Newcastle United now in all competitions. We won two of our first 15 away games this season at Sheffield United and Manchester United, which were great away wins, but the rest of it has been, quite frankly, awful. In fact, if you go back to the end of last season as well, we didn't win quite a few of those uh, last away games. So it's you know Newcastle United winning away from home is a big turnaround uh, discussions about the team in its direction for the rest of the season were very much centered around well you know we had this fantastic home form but did, that didn't seem particularly sustainable and if you can't win away from home in the Premier League against some bad teams like we weren't you're not going to be able to do very much so that seems like it's changed 
So looking at the overall picture of these games, do you, do you think how deserves tremendous credit for, for fixing essentially his biggest problem? Yeah, put it another way, I think we maybe are all guilty of getting a bit too excited <laughs> about the odd um, hiccup on the way we need to chill a bit maybe. Because I thought the, the meltdown after Luton, which we're all guilty of, we were all on our, our, our the podcast kind of lamenting the, the performance and the result. And, um, we need to chill and trust, and trust the process. Like, yes, we all said before Christmas that once we get to this one game a week situation, things will get better. And they have got better. Look, take a step back and look at what we've done since Liverpool, basically. We've been good. Man City, decent. Didn't get the result. Since then, we've been actually really good. And yeah, Luton was pretty poor, but we still drew the game, scored four goals, came from two goals behind. So it's been a really unique season and it's very hard to kind of overanalyze individual situations and think, oh, we should have done that, we should have done that. Like, because it's been so unique and so many ridiculously unprecedented things have happened to us. We've kind of maybe just got to get back on the train and enjoy the ride and stop getting too worried about individual certain situations week on week. It's going to take time. You don't just go from you know, a faltering season to back to where we were before. It'll take time and we keep talking about it incrementally. We seem to be getting there and I think that's a that's a real positive thing. Every every week with three points, every week with players coming back from injury, getting 90 minutes under their belt, it's it's a positive, it's a step in the right direction. I think we've got to, you know, appreciate that as well. There probably will be more bumps in the road um, by the sounds of it. Wilson's <laughs> taking another knock, albeit yeah. he wasn't that involved in the game, but, you know, there's, there's going to be other problems, but how is finding solutions to this? And I thought... um. The, the most pleasing thing is we're, we're finding ways to win games. We've scored a lot of goals from set pieces recently. You know, the, 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 how's finding solutions to, to win football matches with what he's got available to him? And that's credit to him. You're absolutely right. I think he does deserve a lot of credit for, for finding a solution to what was big, big problems uh, in December and even the start of January. Um, and to be honest, like if you just think about December, we're miles, miles away from what we were there, you know, in terms of how we're performing, how we're getting on in these games. We're so far removed from what was going on in December where the same problems were happening. We were basically getting hammered away from home with no answer and thinking about how far we've come in a month and a half. And if we keep going in the right direction, I'm certainly thinking of Europe again. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I think we've got 14 games left in the league um, and we've got 36 points and I reckon 60 points probably gets to Europe. So that's eight wins. Now, our fans used to win at least eight games between now and the end of the season. And I certainly think we've got that in us. Um and this is a season where, you know, it almost feels like this, <laughs> you said it, side like this is almost as disasters hit, you know, and everyone's like, oh my God, what's going on? How, you know, we're not, we're not going to get there. But, you know, I look at it and I think, well, we've got a real good chance of getting into Europe. We're in the FA Cup and have a really good chance of progressing far in that competition. I think you know, we've got a fantastic chance to certainly get to the quarterfinals. We got to the quarterfinals of the League Cup as if it weren't for you know, a last minute slip in the 90th minute and a loss on penalties. Um, and we were 20 minutes away from um, going through to the next round of the Champions League. This has not been a bad season at all. I mean, you know, imagine that three years ago. I, I can't, I really can't. I think what I like so much about sort of what's happening and what we're seeing in front of us in, in terms of these away performances and things like that is is the creativity that... You know, it's 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 tiny tweaks, but it is tweaks. We're getting goals from different places. We're not getting goals from our centre forward. We we played a game without a centre forward last week. Um, it's it's that kind of okay when we don't have that kind of goal threat at the moment. What are we gonna do? And Bruno scores two. Fabian shares scoring loads. It's 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 sort of I don't know what it is. I don't know how to just got like it's this team. It's this teamwork. I know that sounds a bit trite, but it's this. Uh, it's this sort of creative response to qu quite a lot of adversity in November, December. A lot of very bad performances, um, a lot of very tired legs, uh, an inability to to influence anything from the bench. And to look at that, Betty and Mad Dog looking at that and thinking, okay, well, how do we get how do we get goals here? Where do we get them from? Pushing Bruno m more forward yesterday um, allowed him a lot more creativity and a lot more freedom to roam. And Callum Wilson like looked a little bit anonymous yesterday. Didn't have a lot to, to do. I mean, you said earlier he he dealt with their centre backs quite well, but I mean, he, he didn't score any goals, and he and he kept dropping deep because kind of Bruno's roaming around, and and I just I like that. I like that we're we're not just looking for one target man. We're looking at what else have we got in this squad, and how do we score goals, and and turning that into goals. 
to defend Wilson, sorry to interrupt, to defend Wilson, because um, I was very frustrated at his performance, but on reflection, he was he very isolated up front against very two much. centre-halves. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and he absolutely occupied them, if, if nothing else, and, and allowed freedom for some of those other players. Um, but the way we have to play, as I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, because of the, the pace against us and, and having to play a bit deeper and the goalkeeper staying deep, um, it means Wilson's even more isolated. He's actually collecting the ball, receiving the ball around the halfway line, and he's never really been the centre-forward yeah. to pick the ball up in the halfway line and drive us forward 30 yards. He was just doing what he could with the situation he was in. And we didn't really get him the ball in the box more than maybe he got like three or four touches. So it was a frustrating form. So if he's injured again, never mind. But um, <laughs> you're right. It's it's back to what I was saying about just before Christmas. It was very much a case of can we get 11 players together who are fit enough to play a football match with right. no preparation, three game weeks, 11 lads go on, just do your best. Whereas now it's like, okay, we've got a bit more to choose from. We've got a week to prepare. We can have a look at what the opposition have got to offer and come up with a plan. It seems like we're doing that week on week now. And there's just, again, we're just so many miles from what was happening before Christmas that it feels like a totally different season now. Uh, it's 19 goals from seven games wow. in 2024. So almost three a game, Insane. which is remarkable. Yeah. Conceded a few, conceded a few as well. <laughs> but that is fixable. And we know this team can defend very well. So... It is, it is a world away, like you said, Sai, from December, November, in terms of performances, in terms of results. It is, Charlotte, like you say, goals coming from Fabian Shaw and others. So but the, mostly Shaw. There is, there, is, <laughs> there is a kind of, there are just solutions. There's just, there was problems and there have been solutions and that's really promising. One of the most interesting things about where we are right now is we're only five points worse off from the same number of fixtures last season if we'd beat Newton. Last week it would be three points. Now, Newcastle go on to win nine of the last 14 fixtures um, after that Manchester City defeat after the cup final last season. Will they have such a, a kind of a run this season? Well, time will tell, but there, there are positives. We've talked about kind of four key players still to come back, players to you know continue to get fitness. But when I have a look at, which I'm going to do right now in front of me, <laughs> when you look at our, let's talk about the home games, Bournemouth, Wolves, West Ham, Everton, Spurs, Sheffield, Brighton. Uh, there's nothing too too fearsome there is it and if you look at the away games um arsenal tough game uh, cup final for them obviously for ridiculous <laughs> reasons uh, chelsea palace fulham man U, burnley brentford the, you know there are points there we, are, we have nothing to fear and this is where the fixture list comes into it because mm. we haven't got i mean apart from arsenal we haven't got an away game there um that you'd think a, a, a draw is a great result and, and of all the home games you know the hardest game is spurs who are, you know, I'd, I'd expect Newcastle to beat Spurs at home if Newcastle play well and particularly to get some players back. It really does, and wins like this against Forest just kind of, trans I won't call them transformative, but we we were able to look ahead to the rest of the season with a lot more hope than, say, after Luton last week. And again, Luton's result against Sheffield United yesterday makes that performance and result look worse. But I'm pretty sure every single Newcastle fan or everyone listening and watching to this, if you'd said before, Aston Villa... Luton and Forest away, seven points would yeah. be the return. Yeah. yeah, you'd take it. And and like you say, Sai, maybe we can't because we, A, I'm going to excuse all of my own behaviours and opinions. <laughs> B, um, you know, we have to talk about everything because we do this. Um, but you're right, maybe generally we have to look at more than just one result and performance, look at the broader trend, particularly in 2024. And by the way, this is a guy in Eddie Howe who's been, I don't know, he's shafted, but not supported in the transfer window, not 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 because of any desire, but in terms of a, of, a, of a manager who needed reinforcements in a key part of the pitch in midfield, hasn't hasn't had them for reasons that we all know in terms of profit and sustainability stuff. I think it's a pretty remarkable turnaround. And like you say, I don't I don't know if I'm as confident as you are, Si, against Bournemouth, I, like, because Bournemouth are, are a reasonable side. Um, they lost kind of quite comfortably at Fulham and they'll be expecting reaction from that. But... I think how getting four wins in a row, one of them being a derby. I mean, if Newcastle lose that derby, or how loses that derby, God knows where we are. But mm. they won it. They won it comfortably. They won it Fulham comfortably. They won it Villa comfortably. And yesterday, the last 15 minutes is fairly comfortable. That is just not the Newcastle United that we'd seen away from home at any point this season, apart from a, against a disastrous Sheffield United and a chaotic Man United who were, who were going through one of the toughest spells. So really positive overall and... You know, they're giving themselves an opportunity. They're giving themselves a chance of, of, of still doing something spectacular this season, in my view. I think, you, I think you're right as well. And to, if you look at the performances away from home, I think they've been much better than the performances of St. James's Park since the turn of the year, uh, probably with the exception of Man City, where, you know, I think I thought we played pretty well. Um, 
But I, I mean, I remember even I'll go as far as back as Fulham. I remember us um, stood um, <laughs> doing the instant reaction that day, and I said, "I don't think we played particularly well, but we got the result that we needed." And then Boxing Day, we you know we don't want to talk about that too much, but you know, nice reference for Forest. We've got them back, um, but it's good to see us play, perform better away from home. Um, but we just need to make sure that we don't turn up, as you say, in a week's time and go, all right, this is Bournemouth, we'll, we should roll these over, because as you say, they're a reasonable side, and, and they showed that, and their upturn started against us at their mm. place, so you know we, we owe them one, really. We're going to leave it there for part two of the show. We're going to talk about some of the class lads after this break and how they impacted this fixture. Let's talk about the lads who secured this victory for Newcastle United, and I think the first player to talk about is Bruno Gomares, who scores a, a brilliant left-footed volley from a fantastic corner routine, similar to the the Brentford game at home last season when he comes at the back post, just like this one, and he stoops to header that one. This time it's an even better finish, and then the calm, composed curler from the edge of the box side. Uh, I don't think this guy could, you know, could have any more influence on a game than he has there, and we are totally and utterly reliant on the man, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, yeah, for, for the for the aforementioned reasons of the midfield being what it is at the moment, we needed we need big performances from him occasionally, uh, probably every week ideally. But you know when he, when he can just win as a game like single handedly like he did yesterday, it's massive. And we always known he's had that in his locker. And he was grilled post match by Redknapp and the Sky fella, I can't remember his name, um, about kind of uh, oh have you is have is, you wanted to play a bit further up the pitch? And Rafael answered it very very well. He wants to just help the team, and he's happy to play six, happy to play eight, whatever. Um, I thought what the way we lined up yesterday did unleash Bruno a little bit. So yeah, again, the Dan Byrne trade-off of leaving him a bit exposed meant that Bruno was playing in their half of the pitch and causing all sorts of problems on the ball, uh, which we haven't seen because when he plays much deeper, he plays a totally different role. You know, he wins us free kicks, he gets us out of situations, but he doesn't offer that much going forward because he's so far away from goal, whereas when he's playing 30, 40 yards away from goal, we saw what happens, he scored two goals. Now, the first one from the from the corner, we've seen that exact scenario before. I got full-on deja vu. Why the fuck's Miggy taking the corner? What's he doing here? And wh- what is that horribly underhit pass back to trip here? <laughs> he's, ne- he's nearly been tackled. But then Bruno sneaking on the back post. I can't remember the home game. I remember vividly the goal, but I can't remember. I think he heads it. But Brentford, um, I just said. Brentford, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, can't thanks. remember. Yeah, don't remember that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's like, if, if Miggy set a line up to take corner and you're in opposition now, you're just thinking, right, where's Bruno? Right, we, we've got to go and mark Bruno. But yeah, um, just this unbelievable finish to, for the ball to come down and have to make a decision to hit the outside of his right foot to, to well, he could have hit it anywhere in Matt Sells. It probably just goes through him in hindsight. But at the time, Matt Sells had had quite a solid start and he'd made a couple of saves. I think, no, he's, he's going to have one of those games because it's us. But um, yeah, Bruno put put that to, to bed. And uh, just generally speaking, um, we've mentioned already, I thought Miley and Longstaff were pretty quiet and anonymous in the game. So Bruno had so much work to do. And yes, Trippier was the fourth midfielder. And I suppose Trippier might be the, the answer to if Bruno does ever get that yellow card that we don't want him to get. Was that a trial run of Trippier playing in the holding midfield role? I don't know. But yeah, I mean, that the, the, the second goal again, like Bruno, because he's not playing on the halfway line, because he's 10 yards further forward, when that um, Forest right back plays that sort of loose ball inside, Bruno can pounce on it, whereas he wouldn't be able to do that when he's been playing more recently a bit further back. So if Longstaff wins the ball there, he's not going to get it out of his feet in the score. Bruno gets the ball out of his feet. One one touch past another player, bottom corner. And yeah, he sells probably a, a good keeper saves it, but it's still great. It's still, you know, it's a shot on target in a, in, a, in a dangerous area. We need more of that because we don't do it enough and, and it's won as the game. And yeah, you just generally grab that game by the scruff of the neck. There was times when he's just holding on to the ball. You can't tackle him. You literally can't tackle him. And I know he can't tackle other people at the moment, but they can't tackle him. So it's kind of a, a nice fair trade off for, for opposition teams. And yeah, I've, I've never been more, more grateful to have this player in our team. Yeah, the inevitability of him leaving feels more and more so devastating every time I watch him play. He's just so good. But also yesterday in his post-match comments, he was, yeah, yeah, putting, he's, he's staying, he's staying. Oh, they kept asking him that yesterday. It's like, okay, leave that alone. Let's just talk about the goals. Let's just talk about that performance because it was class. Um, but he also said that he's been really ill this week and he didn't even know if he was going to play. I mean, who would play instead of him is a, a ridiculous question. But he was saying, you know, he's, he's been quite sick and I'm not necessarily going uh, <laughs> to talk about how sick because he, he you can find that interview he, he went into detail um <laughs> but he like 24 hours before the game in the morning of the game he wasn't sure he was going to make the game and to, to 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 be there on the fence like ill 
And then to put in that performance, it's like, fuck me, like whenever he does leave, if it's this summer or beyond, hopefully well beyond, that's sad because he is such a player for this team. He is he is a, a playmaker. He brings character. He's so skilled. Players stay off him. They don't know what to do with him. And he scores goals. And we don't win without him. And I can't remember the last time we won without him. We um, well. So, yeah, well, there we go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he, he, he's important. I think it's funny you were talking about Brentford deja vu. I think the second goal is also Brentford deja vu as well. The way that he just take It's almost like we need a goal. I'm just going to get the ball and I'm just going to do what I need to do. Um and only real world-class players can do that. And um, I really hope that this summer isn't the, the PSR cash-in summer for Bruno. I, I'd, I'd like to see us get another season out of him. But who knows where we are with that. I'm just just impressed by his, his ability to cover the ground he does uh, and mm. the discipline not to pick up this. This yellow is, is remarkable considering he's so ill-disciplined to an extent to pick up nine yellow cards as quickly as it did. I mean, it's game 32 that resets, so there's still eight games to go. <laughs> and he has to not get a, 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 another yellow card in the game. I mean, Arsenal away probably is, is the one that jumps out of me. If, that'll be tough. But I remember when he first started, and he, he wasn't starting games, and then when he was starting games, he was constantly being pulled off because he couldn't last the 90. And then that's just such a transformation to to the physical specimen that he is now. He's just... He's just he is Newcastle United at the minute, and we're very lucky that he plays for us. And I love I love those goals because the 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 corner goal at the start because we've outsmarted the opposition. It's not just like a natural ability or the flow of the game or a refereeing decision. It's like we got you, mm. we got you, um, and that's why I, I imagine the fact that he shouts out Tyndall in the post match. Um, I imagine that's incredibly satisfying for them all to kind of think, right, how we're going to burgle a goal out of these lads. And uh, they did it. Let's talk about Fabian Fabian Cher, though. Charlotte, you were very impressed by the man. Yeah, I'm just impressed by him week on week. There's not tons I can say that we haven't said already. He's just, it feels like the whole package. And I, I can't believe that that he costs so little. Um it's four goals for him now across all competitions from our centre back. Like well, I don't think Botman's had a goal yet, has he? No, he scored again. Oh yes, one, right one, now. yeah. He also assisted this one. Oh, okay. So sorry, Botman. I apologise, <laughs> but um, it's it's just not where you expect your goals to be coming from. And to have you know put two in uh, against Aston Villa and then that one yesterday, where he just manages to get into the right position. And when the ball's at his feet and he's in that in that box, I have no doubt he's going to score. And he's a centre back. Like that's not his primary. It's not his primary function on the pitch. And it, he's just so so good. I. I love watching him. I loved watching him yesterday. I He was our player of the month for January, Sellers player of the month for January. And he's consistently the player of the month for me. He's it, 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 undroppable. I don't know who you would bring in for him anyway, but just to to be getting goals out of him, like I said in part two, he's part of that creativity. He's part of that solution finding. And he just does it sort of so coolly as well. He massively stepped up as well when Botman was injured. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think we missed him so much less than we could have done. But, I mean, Botman's a Rolls Royce of a player and um, just consistently churns out consistent performances. And um, the fact that Chair's able to just to step up in that moment and and just, like, it was as if... It, it did feel like we, we didn't have that missing piece. Um, and... The finish yesterday, I think any striker would have been pleased with. And, you know, it was, yeah, it was superb. Absolutely superb. I think that step up as well is it, Fabian Cher made Lascelles look pretty good, I think. Lascelles, I don't want to dig him out. I think he he came in and he did an excellent job for us. Obviously, Botman, when he got back to fitness, comes back in. It's it's That's a no-brainer. I'm sure Lascelles probably wasn't arguing with that. But Lascelles doing so well was because of his partnership with Cher. And, and how much Cher has progressed and elevated his game since Eddie Howe came in. Um, and, and, and that can't be understated either. Yeah, it, I want to talk up Fabian, or Fabian, sorry, Charlotte. I don't, I don't know, that's just what I got told. Am off air, Charlotte corrects me relentlessly. But on air, <laughs> <laughs> it's open season, I don't know how you pronounce the name. Um, it's Cher as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk up these lads, I want to revel in their glory. Yes. But Jesus fucking Christ, that's a soft goal from Forrest's point of view. <laughs> Long ball from the halfway line, bounces in the penalty area, one header, and Fabian Fabian is uh, as unmarked. I mean, you don't save those, Matt Sells. You don't save many, but you definitely <laughs> don't save you don't save those. But God, it's a poor goal from a, a Forest perspective. What are, what are, what 
what the defenders being able to contribute in attacking sense does, though, it, it should, at long term, free up the attacking players more in the box because now opposition teams have to worry about the centre-backs yeah. and, and, and them contributing the goals. So it's really positive. We are going to leave it there, though, for yeah. this week. Thank you very much for listening and watching. We appreciate your support massively. It's always nice to do these when Newcastle win away from home in particular and win they did. A couple of notices from me to play us out. Um, we have a live show coming up the night before Bournemouth next week. It's the Gosforth Civic Theatre in Gosforth. It is lots of your true faith favourites, if you have any. But it's definitely <laughs> me, Charlotte, Sai, and a few others on stage. And uh, would love for you to come along and see us. There are still tickets left. Uh, well over 130 sold. So we can't wait to see everybody there on the night as we talk about this mental football club in this crazy season. We're on Patreon. If you like this podcast and you think, oh, I never wanted to stop, come and join <laughs> on Patreon because it keeps this thing going. You get daily podcasts <laughs> like this about Newcastle United. And when you've beaten Forest and you have Bournemouth at home next, it's the perfect time to come and make your week a little bit better by listening to us, I hope. Thanks for listening. Speak to you all soon. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the £4 pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit begambleaware.org. Uh, be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk.